I'm Natalie MacDonald and you're joining us back in the Dukoscopy TV studio. Now it's only Tuesday but already this week is shaping up to be a corker and joining us to discuss current events is Dr. Frank Hollenbeck. Frank, thank you very much for coming in. Now we're going to start off with Cyprus today, the item on everyone's lips really and we can start, I think, I think this cartoon pretty much says it all really. Now Cyprus's controversial bailout, what's your opinion? Well, as I've said before, um, deposit insurance is an illusion of protection. And what's happened in Cyprus is that uh, it's made the illusion explicit. And Cyprus is basically between a rock and a hard place in the sense that the depositors are going to lose money. Okay. Now, suppose that uh, Cyprus had done an organized default. Okay, what would have happened? Well, they have about 30 billion which are insured. In other words, in Europe, you have insurance up to 100,000 euros. Obviously, Cyprus does not have the money, nor is it able to print it. So what Cyprus would have to do is go back to the Cypriot pound, which was the currency they had before they joined the euro. Now, what they would do is they would set an official conversion rate. So for example, they may set one pound is equal to one euro. So in other words, for your 100,000 euros that you have in the Cypriot bank, okay, you would get 100,000 Cypriot pounds. Now, the, con the official conversion rate has nothing to do with the market rate. So for example, if the market rate was 10 to 1, in other words, 10 Cypriot pounds for one euro, what would happen is that your 100,000 euros would essentially have the buying power of 10,000 euros. So you would take a massive cut in the real value of your deposit. So, in reality, uh, what Cyprus is proposing is actually a lot better than what will happen if uh, Cyprus is forced to default on its debt, in the sense that a 10% cut in deposits is much better than losing maybe 80 or 90% of the real value of your deposit. And the important thing to notice is that uh, Spain and Italy are in exactly the same boat. They're also between a rock and a hard place and they don't really have uh, EU backstop uh, to, give them, uh, to give them money. And um, we're in a situation where we're 2013, I have a PhD in uh, economics and finance and what am I uh, suggesting uh, as advice is a 13th century suggestion which is to take your wealth put it in something that's going to hold value which is gold and stuff it in your mattress okay and that's basically a 13th century um, um, uh, advice. And the incredible thing about uh, the amount of fury that's been generated by this uh, attempt to um, to basically tax deposits is that we've already have a slow motion bank robbery and that's because of the quantitative easing that's been occurring worldwide and no one has been saying anything about that but they're all very upset about having their deposits taxed and that's because uh, our banking system is fraudulent in other words people want their deposits to be deposits in other words they want to make sure the money is there they don't want banks to loan it out. That's why it's what I've suggested before is that we need to separate deposit banking from loan banking, implement the Chicago plan in Europe and uh, set up uh, the world economy to be a stable uh, environment for our children. We're coming up to the end of the month, which means next on our agenda, as it were, will in fact be Greece as the Troika returns to the country. What can we expect from this? Well, the thing about Greece is something that I teach my students, which is the second most important theory in finance, which is the concept of sunk costs. And to give you an example, the classical example we use is Lockheed. Uh, they were developing the Lockheed TriStar in 1970, and it spent uh, $2 billion in research and development and marketing and uh came the time to make a decision to go forward and they basically said well we have to go forward because we've already spent two billion dollars that was a monumental mistake because they went on to lose three more billion dollars and the company went bankrupt because of it and this concept of sunk costs is also can also be applied in finance for example if you buy something at a hundred dollars and it drops to fifty dollars the fact that you bought it a hundred dollars is irrelevant Okay. How many times do you have people say, oh, I have to wait until I get my money back? That's a big mistake. In other words, every day is a new day. In other words, the 
drop from $100 to $50 is what we call a sunk cost. And your decision is, is this the best place for my $50? It's not the fact that you bought it $100. Now we have a very similar situation in Greece, okay? In the sense that we've put a lot of money, we've given them, given them a lot more money, and we're probably going to have to give them even more money. And the thing about Greece is very similar to what we saw in Argentina. Uh, the IMF was in Argentina for almost 10 years, and uh, ultimately, Argentina uh, defaulted on their debt, and, it, in a <clears throat> and in a 2005 report, the IMF basically said is that there was neither the cultural or structural desire to make the necessary structural adjustments. And we can see the same thing in Greece. For example, we're five years into the uh, crisis and Greece still hasn't done much of the privatization that it needs to do. It's, it's been talking about firing the 150,000 uh, government employees for the last three years. And the hang up now with the Troika is basically to fire 25,000 this year and then the rest during 2014-2015. What we really should do from Greece is walk away. It's view it as a sunk cost and then bear the consequences because the further we push out the problem, the more difficult it will be and the more dangerous it will be for Europe. If we shift over west and lastly take a look at the US, we've had sort of an improvement in data coming out of the US economy. Is the worst behind us? Well, uh, for example, uh, Deutsche Bank just raised their forecast for the U.S. economy. And when you read the uh, newspapers, they tell you about car sales going up, housing sales going up. And uh, I kind of look at the data. First, let's look at the unemployment rate. It dropped, I think, to 7.7%. But much of that drop was due to individuals basically dropping out of the labor market. People running out of unemployment insurance and basically saying, I can't find a job. Therefore, I'm just not going to start looking for a job. We also had an increase in the number of temporary workers. When we look at uh, a better measure of the unemployment rate, which is the P2P measure uh, produced by uh, Gallup, we can see that um, the percentage of adult population employed full-time by an employer actually dropped at the beginning of 2013. Now, we also had retail sales go up. But why did retail sales go up? They went up because gas prices went up. So in other words, this is good news. In other words, you're going to spend a lot more to get to work. In other words, you're gonna spend a lot more to fill your gas tank, which means that this is good news. You have more money to spend on other goods and services. Obviously not. So for me, the increase in the retail sales did not indicate an improvement in the situation in the United States. And when you look at other measures, such as uh, U.S. commercial bank lending, you see that it's not improving. Uh, whether that's consumer loans, whether that's uh, business loans, mortgage loans, or even real estate loans, we're not really seeing a pickup in um, economic activity. So for me, this resembles a lot 2011 and 2012, where we had uh, this optimism that basically petered out by, uh, by the summer. Frank, thank you so much for your comments. Stay tuned to Ducoscopy TV for more updates on all of these stories. For now, though, goodbye.